thank you very much for being uh, with us today. Please tell me your name and the project that you are working on. My name is Anish Mohammed, and I'm the found, co-founder and CTO of Panda Protocol. Uh, what is Panda Protocol? So Panda Protocol effectively provides privacy for DeFi, interoperable, composable privacy for DeFi with selective disclosure. So I should probably explain two lines to that. One is the fact that selective disclosure means if you are actually doing KYC and at some point later in time, you want to go to HMRC or uh, the IRS in the US and provide your tax returns, you are able to prove to them that you are the entity that tried doing this transaction. So this is what you know, Panther does. Um, it is a little bit the holy grail of so many different uh, use cases. You just cited one, but there are many others. Absolutely. Identity yeah. uh, on blockchain, yeah. uh, both for us who have to go through the same process, providing passport yeah. and everything else, a hundred times over, yeah. but uh, for many, many other uh, applications. Um, now, it, why do you think uh, you are going to be the one to crack uh, this uh, problem? Oh, yes. So firstly, uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding and eating it. So I think we had a first bite of the pudding. Mm-hmm. So uh, our team has already built the MVP. It's on the testnet now. So from a theoretical perspective, like you solve the problem, you write the code, make it working. That's the first bit. The other b- bit is all about business. So we are in conversations with a bunch of a very well-recognized set of people, which I can't reveal at this point in time because our MOUs are going to be published in a couple of days or so. So very large entities, which has very deep connections with uh, investment banking and banking sector, and similarly very deep connections with uh, nation states. So in fact, they have a project, which is a nation state project that they have on the pipeline that we are going to work, collaborate together on that. So for me, technology-wise, as a technologist, I think I have a very clear view of where I stand because I had my first bite of the, ch- or, you know, in, in the proverbial sense. This is already kind of done. But at the business sense, which is like the bigger of the two problems, and I think we've all almost already closed most of the problem in that sense. We definitely can bootstrap. We've been talking to a bunch of very interesting people that are interested in doing this. And uh, at least a couple of them have agreed to work with us and we've signed contracts and we are waiting for them to you know, publish the MOU. So today's a Sunday, so nothing happens in the West. So tomorrow or day after, you could see some of the announcements coming out and that probably will tell you what I'm alluding to here. Uh, what is the uh, technology stack uh, on oh, which you uh, built your uh, solution? So, so I should probably you know, caveat myself in saying this. The reason I say that is like, this is, is a roadmap. It's a path towards achieving what we need to achieve. We made a bunch of compromises in building what we built as a minimum viable product in that sense. So we built on Ethereum, we built on Polygon, as in like L2 and Polygon, and we are using the knowledge systems to create the privacy along with some game, game theoretic perspective. So as it stands right now, we are working with EVM compatible blockchains. We are in the process of building an interchain index that actually has privacy. We also have the ability to put an adapter that allows any arbitrary DeFi protocol to interact with Panda protocol. So starting with Ethereum, uh, with a Polygon as an L2, we start. We've already been, uh, we've signed a contract with uh, uh, Flare. We've been given 50 million tokens as the grant and uh, uh, Songbird has been released. Our you know, equivalent grant in Songbird has been allocated to us. So we are also in the process of starting up a team to actually build that. So we will have like a whole bunch of these being built out in the next 12 plus months time. Like you could expect uh, at least possibly two of the top 10 uh, blockchain protocols who we are talking to having uh, bridges or appropriate on the Panther. And, and, and then, of course, uh, not only uh, towards uh, the, the base layer, but yeah. also on the application uh, layer. Yeah. Uh, uh, you need uh, developer relations. Uh, you need all kinds of uh, exciting integrations yeah. so that for the uh, end user, yeah. uh, using Panda protocol will yeah. be completely transparent. Absolutely. So, so that is something that is going to be the more interesting challenge in that sense. We are not get, getting into the game of the layer one protocols, which is like if you... Uh, as everybody 
knows money is a belief system. Cryptocurrency is a belief system. Blockchain is a belief system. Blockchain actually has uh, prophets and apostles, and you can name them. Some prophets are invisible. Other prophets have been around, right? I've been in this ecosystem uh, very early on, so I was an early advisor to Ripple from 2013. I was one of the people involved in the Swarm team, so I reviewed the orange paper. So I've seen everybody going through all the process where people who are mere humans became uh, prophets and apostles, well, I don't really believe that were true, but that's what life is all about. You see, you know, transitioning happening, and some you, you, you believe and you agree with, some you, you know, you, you don't believe and you don't agree with. So that challenge is still open. We actually need to, you know, convince the large ecosystem that uh, the delayed gratification for the Panther protocol is real. If you put in effort, you will clearly have an upside. The way I would say to them is very simple, and uh, you could probably look at Forbes or anybody else. It is incredibly clear to everybody that privacy is the key thing for DeFi to be, you know, really have that bloom that's been missing. And saying that, I would say June, uh, you know, 2019, 2020, when I was teaching in various universities, I created a deck of slides like yesterday I was talking. It like 66 mil is the volume of decks a day at that point in time in the June 10th. Uh, June 20th, uh, 2020, right? And then June 10th, I think. And now it's like 450 times more, right? And we still haven't reached the ceiling. The ceiling will only be reached when we actually have the ability to defend your alpha, which is what I think is interesting in terms of privacy. Not just for a retail investor like you or me, but for the institutional. We need to look at the world slightly differently in the world in the macroeconomic sense. As David was actually describing DLTX, David, David Johnston from DLTX was saying, 93% inflation is in that sense is there. That's like in a total M1 in that sense. So what that implies is uh, all the institutions that are in the traditional finance space are looking for a yield. And if you're looking for the kind of normal yield you, you got to get on a, a treasury bond, you are looking at 2 3%. And if you look at anything in DeFi, you're looking at a lot more than that. And the thing that you need to recognize is the fact that typically they have the ability to shield their, shield their whatever strategy they have, which doesn't exist in a blockchain. And this is where we think you know, the real value add of Panda comes to institution. You can still have your KYC, you can still have your selective disclosure. At the same time, you have the ability to defend your alpha. If you do that in a traditional DeFi, the moment you deploy your strategy, somebody could copy it, they could front run you, they'd just copy you, the depth of the market disappears right in front of your eyes. All the effort you put in to actually build the strategy disappears in no time. So this is how I think about it. So um, the uh, approach, as you described, is uh, important and convenient to uh, retail operators, Absolutely. but it is existentially important Absolutely. to uh, institutional uh, operators. Yep. As such, uh, uh, it can accelerate the shift uh, uh, of capital uh, into, into blockchain, into yep. DeFi, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, radically. Yep. Uh, what do you think about the, uh, not only socioeconomic, but maybe even geopolitical I implications of uh, such a fundamental shift, uh, the role of the, the, the U.S. dollar, the role of the petrodollar yep. uh, is already uh, being uh, uh, questioned. Yep. Uh, and as uh, 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 solar and uh, batteries and, and hydro together with uh, Bitcoin mining yep. is uh, enabling um, a new kind of uh, energy financial system, yep. Uh, to be put in place, uh, the uh, shift of uh, uh, trillions and yep. tens of trillions yep. of dollars of capital yep. is almost unavoidable, unstoppable. Yep. So, so let me put it in a slightly different perspective. So I'm going to play this out slightly differently. So the way I say it is like the world could be divided into liquid assets and illiquid assets. So liquid assets are the easier ones to trade and you actually have the ability to do most of what you do. Illiquid assets constitute the larger chunk of it and you create derivatives and other things on top of it. What has actually happened is NFTs allow you to create uh, liquidity for illiquid assets. And what essentially, you know, DeFi protocols have allowed it to do is to do price discovery for any modality of uh, illiquid asset. 
Now, if you were to think about what I just said, what Panda would enable somebody to do is you as a traditional institution has the ability to create a dark wall on demand to provide privacy to achieve what you normally do for all assets which you didn't have access to prior because all the liquid assets couldn't be liquidized, liquidated as fast as we can do with an NFT. That is a game changer without a shadow of a doubt. Now you're asking me about the shift in geopolitics in terms of where politics and power really reside. I would say there's a third angle that's actually missing. The CBDCs that are coming in is actually shifting the dynamic of the equation. To me, it's a good one and a, probably a mixed one, right? Because it's like if there are CBDCs that are coming in with really the ins with the objective to have higher resolution information on the average citizen, to me, that is a very, very, very dangerous path to tread. At the same time, you were pointing at the possibility that you know the petrodollar is on the decline. Yes, the petrodollar is in decline for multiple reasons. Firstly, as you rightly pointed out, the EV revolution in that sense has actually you know really dented a large amount of it. But at the same time, what we need to do and we need to understand is the, that struggle is not over. We need to clearly understand the fact that the whole EV revolution is kind of held hostage by a few nation states who have access to the rare earth material that is required for creating both uh, lithium polymer batteries and also the permanent magnets that you need to have in those motors, right? So that is a non-trivial challenge. Petrol, the, the, the petrol dollar economy has never been without blood being spilled on the, on the surface of earth. We know that we have seen so many wars, right? And we have seen more wars in the Gulf state than anywhere else in the world. So you can only imagine what the next set of struggles, power struggles would be. So in saying so, I'm saying as like, so far, the revolution that has been triggered by Bitcoin has been a bloodless one. I would hope that that would be the direction where we continue to do this and we achieve what we, uh, as a larger human society who value privacy, who value democracy, who value diversity, who want to have inclusion, have a better chance of having fairer distribution of resources without actually taking guns. Uh, the value of uh, privacy is traditionally seen as uh, accruing mostly to the individual, forgetting how important for society as a whole is the ability to experiment with necessary future adaptations that start as a minority behavior and only once uh, it is uh, uh, beyond a given threshold uh, almost suddenly spreads yeah. uh, uh, all over. Yeah. Uh, there have been many, many examples of this like uh, uh, the prohibition of alcohol in the yeah. United yeah. States yeah. or uh, the uh, same-sex marriage. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, uh, now uh, recreational uh, marijuana yeah. in more and more uh, jurisdictions. These are uh, criminal behaviors until they are not. Yeah. And that means that uh, a society that does not understand and respect private behavior, individual uh, mm. privacy, uh, and is tolerant towards uh, a, a certain degree of deviation, yeah. It cannot adapt towards the future. It locks itself down in a given pattern mm. and becomes brittle mm. until it breaks. Yeah. So, Do it, you fear mm. that, as you mentioned, the CBDCs mm. will strip away the anonymity of cash in exchange of some supposed advantage and it will be sold to the public without mentioning these implications. This, this is literally exactly what I was about to go and uh, I was about to interrupt. Apologies for trying to interrupt, but literally that is what I was thinking. So the challenge we have is like societies where democracy is the norm, privacy is implied. You can't have democracy without privacy. Your ability to exercise your right of a vote is implied by privacy. So if you lose that, there's no democracy. Now you could actually go, if there is a possibility to correlate your decision-making process of your vote, and that has to tie in with your buying power and other things, then by constitution, most constitutions support democracy. If by that 
extending the logic downwards, I would say most constitutions should support privacy in terms of financial transactions. And I think, you know, it will be very, very challenging for the politicians of the world to really try and describe this in other, any other way around, at least in the parts of the world where democracy is considered a norm. If democracy is not considered a norm and if it's an authoritarian regime, the regime actually says to you, you should do this, that's what it is. Possibly, yes, because you don't have a control over it. But in other situations where you have a democratic situation, where you have the right to choose, your right to choose, if you could probably prove in a court of law, is very much closely related to your ability to buy things and the information that could be gleaned out of your decision-making process, then I am reasonably certain that the, the legal system of the world will recognize the need for having privacy and hence the ability for people to sell CBDC without privacy as something key will have been a real challenge. On the other side, I just wanted to describe this so just to un so that the leaders of the world understand the stupidity of what they're trying to do. So if there is an adversarial situation where you have a CBDC with no privacy and there is another nation that has privacy, what effectively you are giving them is a very good view of your economy day to day. They don't even have to have an economic intelligence unit to understand exactly what you're doing. A little bit of chain analysis and they are just having an x-ray yeah, on, on everything. Everything. So it's, you know, it's like a, they were giving them a discount to their intelligence operation. It, it is a little bit like uh, those intelligence uh, uh, agencies that want to uh, weaken encryption yeah. in the belief that they will be the only ones uh, being absolutely. able to exploit absolutely. it. Yeah. I mean, this is a notion that a lot of people have. Most people don't recognize a bell curve essentially mean wherever you in all likelihood, wherever you sat, there are more people to the right of you in that sense of speaking. You are very unlikely to be the last one, the farthest out, right? It's very unlikely. So when you make the assumption that everybody is to your left, which is the assumption that you're finding out, it is very, very unlikely that is the case. And you will be, I would say, rudely surprised how stupid you are by other people. Yeah. So um, the ability of uh, a, a general population to uh, absorb and then act on uh, notions yep. that come at an accelerating pace yep. or actually where the rate of acceleration is increasing and yep. it is becoming a jolting uh, yep. pace yep. Uh, is severely uh, limited by uh, our literally mental uh, abilities. Yep. We need time to get familiar with certain concepts. Yep. Uh, you know, just like we have a, a, a very well developed uh, uh, sense of uh, our physical wallet yep. being or not being yeah. in our yeah. pan pockets, yeah. Yeah. but we don't have the equivalent uh, uh, well developed reactions uh, uh, towards our uh, digital wallet, wallet yeah. uh, for example. Yeah. Um, how can people who are in the forefront of designing and providing advanced solutions facilitate this process? I think there's a very, very, very good question. You pretty much are hinting what you probably are expecting I'm going to say. So the situation is the following, right? Whenever transitions happen, transitions happen from the known to the unknown, not from unknown to unknown. So anything that comes in, it's better anchored when you know something and you're moving from there to something else. So if you were to think about a physical wallet and you were to think about a virtual wallet, the behavior that you are used to in a physical wallet, if it is replicated to the largest degree in a virtual wallet, that will create a large amount of comfort. Humans are creatures of habit. The habit that we've had when we get out of the room, when we leave the house, we take our, take our wallet and put it into our pocket. So this behavior that we have accrued over our lifetime, it won't happen, disappear tomorrow. It will take a while to disappear. At the same time, I need to warn everybody about you know, how adoption really changes human behavior. I know most people don't recognize that the fact that you have a smartphone in your hand has significantly changed the way you behave, the way you are being taught, the way you respond to things. If you have a question, most likely you go to Google to ask rather than think it through, which is a real uh, offloading or outsourcing of your cognitive abilities. You are kind of offloading your 
you know, I, I would say system two thinking to some external entity, which was never considered like a real thing like 30, 40 years ago. So this has really happened. And the thing that we need to understand is like, this also implies we are kind of at the edge of a BCI, even though a very low channel BCI, right? A being computing interface in that sense. So my take to anybody who's designing any system is like, look at history. History is a very good teacher. There's always lesson to be learned. Every time a new technology comes in and, and changes the way the society evolves, there are lessons that's been learned from how it influenced the society and how society responded to it. So, as I was saying before, there were instances where there were bloodbaths. I am very, very optimistic that we will actually have a large amount of adoption without having bloodbaths. And um, it is uh, a, a hope and a desire that I share and uh, people like you and many others, uh, uh, we are working hard uh, both uh, in, in uh, implementing systems but also in sharing uh, knowledge so that uh, anyone, uh, both those who are formerly disenfranchised and become empowered, but also those who feel threatened by the change because their power could be eroded by this. So the, the, the comfort that all of those groups uh, need to feel is that they have a role to play in the future, yep. that they will be welcome yep. and they will be able to uh, uh, live uh, uh, empowered, emancipated lives uh, regardless of uh, their the role in society yep. Yep. Or, or, or their geographical location. Yep. Uh, Anish, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Good luck uh, with you. the rollout of the main net and sure. the announcement of the partnerships. I'm looking forward to following the path of yourself as well as of Panda Protocol. Uh, th thank you very much. It's a pleasure, as usual, talking to you. All right.